Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. One of the earliest videos I did on this channel is called Don't Buy an RV. Inspired largely by a piece I wrote for Jalopnik called Don't Buy an RV. And the piece and the video got so much reaction that it's been a popular topic to discuss RVs on this channel and the purchases of them. And so Ross, who is an attorney in Salem, Virginia, sent me a note yesterday. I said, Steve, check this story out. It's an opinion issued by a federal judge on an RV case. Someone bought an RV, had problems with it, filed a lawsuit, and to see what they went through and where they are right now makes you understand that if you want to buy an RV today, you must be borderline insane if you want to buy a brand new one. Uh, otherwise, if you see what you're up against, you might have second thoughts. So that's my, my point here is you can buy one if you want to, but don't complain later when somebody goes... Um, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that, and, and uh, you know, you're, you're out of luck. Sorry. You, you, you are on notice with cases like this. The case is called Macaulay versus FCA because Chrysler is a party to this. They built, apparently, a portion of the vehicle underneath that drives it around. But uh, this matters before the court, and again, a federal court, Virginia, on defendant Camping World RV sales, motion to dismiss, and defendant Thor Motor Coach's motion to transfer the case so the plaintiff filed the complaint alleging breaches of contractual and statutory warranties against FCA, Camping World, and Thor. Camping World now seeks to dismiss plaintiff's claim against it, uh, and Thor seeks to transfer the case to Indiana, South Bend, uh, to be more specific. The parties have filed memoranda supporting their respective positions. The court heard oral argument on August 3rd, 2023. For the following reasons, the motions will be granted. On November 20th of 22, plaintiff purchased the 2022 Thor Tolero camper van from Camping World, a retail sales outlet, and the price was $99,000, $99,545 to be exact. When making this purchase, plaintiff signed a buyer's order, which will also call the purchase contract, with Camping World. The purchase contract contained a warranty disclaimer on the front page that reads, dealer makes no guarantee or warranty express or implied. This vehicle is sold by dealer as is with no dealer guarantee or warranty implied or express. Dealer does not affirm or adopt any manufacturer warranties available to this unit or any of its components. The rest here is in all caps and underlined and bolded. Dealer hereby disclaims and excludes from the sale all warranties expressed or implied, including the implied warranty of merchantability and the implied warranty of fitness. Buyer acknowledges this disclaimer is made in capitalized, bold, and underlined font and is conspicuous. <laughs> now, that's funny. That's, that's funny. Because one of the things that they discuss is that these warranties must be conspicuous. And I've seen warranties that were in the same size font as everything else around them. So here they made it bold, underlined, and in all caps. And then they actually have you signing a document that says that you find it to be conspicuous. So you can't make the argument, well, Your Honor, it wasn't conspicuous. Because the judge can say, well, you signed a statement that it was. But most people don't know what that means. Most people have got no clue what any of that means when they're buying their $99,000 RV. Uh, meanwhile, the back of the contract contained a separate disclaimer, which said, and again, all caps, uh, bold, underlined, disclaimer of warranties, limitation, exclusion of remedies. Dealer makes no guarantee or warranty expressed or implied and hereby disclaims and excludes the implied warranty of merchantability and the implied warranty of fitness for a particular purpose from this sales transaction. And such warranty shall not apply to this transaction or the unit. Buyer understand and agree that dealer makes no warranty on this unit and that any pre-delivery inspection or service performed does not constitute or create any dealer warranty of any type expressed or implied. Buyer understands and agrees that all terms of this agreement are binding and shall apply in all instances, even if buyers elect to purchase an extended service contract. Buyers understand and agree that the express terms of any manufacturer's written warranty to the extent any exist and apply to the unit contain and constitute buyers' exclusive and sole remedy for any problems or defects the unit might contain. Buyers understand and agree that any other potential available remedy under the Uniform Commercial Code or otherwise, including but not limited to rejection, rescission, or revocation of acceptance, are hereby disclaimed by and unavailable against dealer. Buyers understand and agree that the terms of this agreement, including all disclaimers of warranties and damages, are conspicuous and shall apply under all circumstances, even if buyers' available remedies fail of their essential purpose. <laughs> 
Again, I'm laughing because number one, it's so, so comprehensive. And number two, there's your disclaimer right there. See all that big, bold lettering? Okay, one of the biggest disclaimers I've ever seen in my legal career, and I've been practicing law for 32 years. And, and that's not hyperbole. That is not. During the transaction, plaintiff also signed a warranty registration form for the limited warranty that Thor provided for the vehicle. Both the limited warranty and the registration form contained a forum selection clause. And that's where, you, in advance, you agree if it's going to be an argument, we're going to have it over there. So any lawsuits in this matter would have to be filed in Indiana, governed by Indiana law. So you can buy this thing in Florida. You can buy it in California. You can buy it in Alaska, assuming there's a dealer up there. But you have a problem with it? you got to go to Indiana and file your action there, just to let you know. So that clause read, I understand that exclusive jurisdiction for deciding legal disputes relating to alleged breach of express warranty and applied warranties that arise by operation of law, as well as those relating to representations of any nature, must be filed in the courts within the state of manufacture, which is Indiana. If there is a conflict between this forum selection clause and another party's forum selection clause, this forum selection clause controls. <laughs> They're anticipating that another party might stick a forum selection clause into their disclaimers. About two weeks after purchase, the van began having issues. Plaintiff says the roof, ceiling fan, and vent leaked. There was damage to the plumbing, a cracked pump, and a backward filter. Now, we don't know which filter that was. Most notably, the engine failed. Most notably, the engine failed, and the steering locked up while plaintiff was driving on the interstate. After this happened, the van was towed to an FCA dealer in Virginia. Plaintiff asserts that despite multiple repair attempts, the van remains unrepaired to this day. So he had it two weeks, broke down, took the dealer, hasn't been fixed since. That's the allegation. Keep in mind that for the purposes of this motion, the court assumes those to be true. So some in the audience will go, well, Steve, you know, we don't know their tone. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. The allegation is they had it for two weeks. Broke down, hasn't been fixed since. Okay? So remember, they bought it in 2022 in November. So it was still 2022 when it broke down. And it's been at a dealer all of 2023 and wherever we are right now, 2024. So the allegation is that's the case, and the court says, let's assume those facts are true. Based on these facts, plaintiff followed the following action. Breach of warranty, revocation of acceptance, breach of express and implied warranties under Mag Moss, and violation of the Motor Vehicle Warranty Enforcement Act, which I'm guessing is Virginia's Lemon Law. So the court then addresses Camping World's motion to dismiss. And Camping World uh, brought that, and the court does say here, that the court accepts as true all well-pled facts and all of that. Uh, if the allegations are facially plausible, then the court will assume they're true for these purposes. Uh, but says, you know something? Camping World says that they disclaimed all their warranties. So in order to disclaim all implied warranties under Virginia law, a written disclaimer must be conspicuous and mention merchantability. Was their disclaimer conspicuous? Well, yes, it was, because the plaintiff even signed a statement saying it was. And did it mention merchantability? It mentioned it at least twice. I don't have to go back and look at it. I remember twice. Those are the kinds of things that I count because I'm an attorney. So it turns out that um, the court finds that those disclaimers are all good and Camping World gets out of the lawsuit. You cannot sue who you bought it from. doesn't matter how defective it is. You signed a statement saying you wouldn't do that. So now let's get back to the manufacturer. Now, the manufacturer didn't file a motion to dismiss. They filed a motion to transfer to get the case from Virginia up to Indiana. Transfer of a civil case in federal court is governed by statute, which states that for the convenience of parties and witnesses in the interest of justice, a district court may transfer any civil action to any other district or division where it might have been brought or to any district or division which all parties have consented. So the statute says specifically that the parties can consent, and it doesn't matter if you consented before or after you filed your lawsuit, you consented. You signed a statement saying you consented. And again, a lot of people are going to go, Steve, but no one would know what that meant. Who knows what forum selection means if you're not an attorney? It uh, doesn't matter. I'm not saying this is right. I'm just saying this is the state of the industry right now. You go into a dealer, especially a big dealer, 
and buy one of these things, they're going to have you sign a document like that. And you go, well, I don't want to buy this thing without, you know, if I have to sign that document, I go, too bad. Too bad. You, you know, don't, don't buy it then. Because they all do it. They all do it. So then the question becomes, what about FCA? Because as you may guess, FCA, which is the, uh, I, I like to jokingly say FC stands for formerly Chrysler, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's what we call Chrysler these days. And of course, it's Fiat Chrysler. FCA LLC, I believe, is the uh, official name of the entity. But they built, apparently, the drivetrain and possibly the chassis or whatever's underneath this thing. And, and of course, they have a presence in all 50 states. And they actually didn't have much of a dog in this fight because they don't really care where it gets tried. Except, if you're a defendant, you'd like to see the plaintiff jump through hoops to get to court. So FCA kind of stepped back and said, we'll let these parties fight over this. And so the federal court said, because you signed all of those heinous disclosures, heinous being my word, not theirs, um, you are bound by them. And you agreed, number one, to never sue the selling dealer, regardless of what happened to this thing. And number two, you agreed to try this case in Indiana under Indiana law. Now, they raised a bunch of arguments, the plaintiff did, including, including an argument that he lives in Virginia. He bought it in Virginia. Shouldn't Virginia law govern that transaction? Wouldn't you think? Uh, well, you sign a statement saying you're happy to try it in Indiana under Indiana law. And, and, and you sign that statement. And so I get phone calls about RVs at my office. And, and I tell people I don't handle RV cases anymore, largely because of this. This has gotten worse over the years. I used to handle RV cases. And RVs used to be sold with purchase agreements very similar to what they use for cars. And for whatever reason, the RV industry started going more and more in this direction, both at the sales level between you and the seller and with the manufacturer and their warranties and all the disclaimers there. And of course, the, the forum selection clause. So if you buy an RV today at a big dealer, chances are they're going to ask you to sign a document that is going to look a lot like this and a lot like that. And then they go, just sign this. And I dare you to ask the salesman, what does this mean? And the salesman will probably say, oh, it's just legalese. Uh, our attorneys put that there. Uh, or I don't know, that's just in the document. It's just there. We're not allowed to change this. And pre-printed forms always look like they're carved in stone. They're not. You could negotiate that, but they aren't willing to negotiate on it. And that's the craziest part to me. The guy's buying a $99,000 RV, $99,000, okay? And yet, I'm willing to bet you, he had a zero bargaining power at the dealership. Now, you'd think, you'd think if you sit down at any other place and you're about to spend $99,000, you'd think you'd get some consideration. You said, hey, I want to modify some terms of this contract. I want to change this. I want, I want one of those. I want, I want to move this around. That right there is carved in stone. You cannot change any of that verbiage. You cannot. And so if you're going to get yourself an RV these days, understand this, that you're getting yourself into a purchase, which if everything goes perfectly well, you're fine. If anything goes wrong, you might find yourself in a situation like this guy who files the lawsuit and finds out that, number one, he cannot sue the seller. Number two, he must go to Indiana to sue the manufacturer, and strangely enough, to sue Chrysler. And it's all going to be handled under Indiana law. And that's because he signed documents consenting to that. I've mentioned before, and this is one of those adages you should remember. If you sign a document, most courts will assume that you read it, that you understood it, and that you agreed to it. That's what your signature means. Okay? In a contract setting. So someone hands you a contract, goes, here, sign this. If you don't agree with it, don't sign it. You cannot later say, I didn't understand it. It's presumed you understood it. Okay? That's important to understand. And Ross pointed out one thing that I don't talk much about. I've mentioned it before in passing. But there's a legal concept called revocation of acceptance. And let's suppose that I go into the widget store to buy a widget, and I'm purposely using a non-automobile example. 
I go into the store to buy a widget. A widget is a device that does something. And I drop $1,000 buying a widget. And it's in a box. And the guy goes, I guarantee you this, bo- this thing will work. It even says in the box, manufacturer warrants it, all that. Let's assume that there's no signed documents or anything like that. I simply buy a $1,000 widget. I take it home, take it out of the box. Does not work. Assume these facts are true. It does not work. I take it back to the selling dealer. I say, hey, look, my widget doesn't work. And the guy goes, hey, uh, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me take it and back and look at it. Guy takes it around back. You hear him back there fidgeting and nuts and bolts and screwdrivers. Comes back out and goes, here you go. It works now. It works now. You take it home, plug it in. It does not work. Assume these facts are true. Still does not work. You bring it back to the dealer and go, dude, my widget still doesn't work. You told me it was fixed. Guy goes, I don't know what to tell you. Don't know what to tell you. I fixed it. It worked. And you go, dude, I've had this thing now, and, and I brought it home a couple times. It does not work. Can you replace it for me? The guy goes, no. Can I have my money back? No. You can, at that point in time, revoke your acceptance of it. Because when you accepted it, you did not know that it didn't work. And this is covered by the UCC. So you have the right to then give it back to them and go, okay, I no longer accept it. Now I want my money back. Now they're probably not going to give you your money back. I've, I've dealt with so many revocation cases where somebody gave something back and the seller refused to refund their money. But believe it or not, one of the most famous cases in Michigan is a case called Colonial Dodge, where a guy revoked his acceptance of a station wagon back in, I believe, 1978. I could be wrong on the year, but it's been a little while since I looked at it. And um, he revoked his acceptance of the station wagon. And he actually left it parked in front of his house, and he called the dealer and said, come get it. And they said, no. And so he filed a lawsuit. Guess what? That went to the Michigan Supreme Court. They said, yeah, you can revoke acceptance of it. And by the way, leaving it in front of your house and telling them to come get it is actually a perfectly good way to do that. It might be an extreme case. But the point is that if the seller doesn't deliver by giving you something that you were negotiating with them to buy... You can revoke acceptance if they can't cure it by remedying it or replacing it. So they actually put that concept in their disclaimer and said, you're waiving that too. So inside this mass of disclaimers, it says, oh, by the way, you are giving up your right to revoke your acceptance of this if it doesn't meet the needs of the contract. So their legal liability ends the second you take delivery of that. And now it might be true that you've got the right to bring it to them for service under the manufacturer's warranty, but that's different. So if this thing doesn't work, it doesn't run, it doesn't, you'd think in a typical situation with a widget, you can revoke your acceptance of it. Here you can't. You waived your right to do that. So again, most people are going to say, but Steve, how would anybody know that? Well, here you are signing a document containing phrases you don't understand. Probably shouldn't do that. So again, that gets me back to my original theme, why you'd have to be insane to buy an RV nowadays. And that's why. Now, it very well could be that you buy an RV, you travel the country with it in your golden years, and you're happy until the day you and it die. And hopefully it outlives you. That could be the case. That could be the case. However, if it's not, good luck with court. Because there's going to be a bunch of documents you probably signed that painted you into a corner that you can't get out of. So there you go. Uh, Ross, thanks for sending it. Questions or comments, put them below. Let's talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. When the going gets tough, the tough use duct tape.